Well, here's a little quick video for you. I was going to uh, work my way through a little bit of a few little short stories. I mean, last week's video was 43 minutes long. You know, I didn't really mean to make it that long. Sorry about that. But uh, this is, I'm just going to talk a little bit about stuff. And whenever I'm talking about stuff, I like to start with um, the older stuff and work their way forward. You know, I don't, I don't know. Some uh, people might not like that. They might want to just jump right into the new stuff. But uh, one of the things that has been fairly universal in what engines need. A lot of stuff that they needed as far as drivability goes uh, back in the day they still need now and the dash pot was one of the things that used to be you know first time I ever saw one of those things I said what is that little thing dad? And he says well that's a dash pot and he didn't really explain to me what it did but I found out later on whenever I got heavy into drivability work uh, that it basically catches the throttle and lowers it slowly uh, so if you let it slap shut too quick, you know, you'll get an engine stall a lot of the time. Um, that was something that, uh, and it, there's an adjustment, you know, you see that nut there, so that you could basically adjust it so that it would, you know, catch the throttle. Now it would release, if you, when you apply the throttle, it extends quickly, but whenever you let the throttle slap back on it, it goes down slowly. And, uh, and you know, the, uh, if you look up dash pots, you're going to see uh, them talking about it, uh, keeping stuff from moving too fast, basically, but that's what, uh, a dash pot did on a carburetor. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that uh, General Motors had that they put on some of their cars in the real early 80s and probably some late 70s that I didn't see was they had this out of load compensator and Ford had that on some of their escorts too. Uh, and it was basically a sort of a diaphragm uh, with a heavy spring in there so that, uh, and it had vacuum connected to it. Uh, so whenever engine vacuum dropped uh, like for if there was an engine load, you know, like it's at idle, it's only it worked at idle uh, when it was sitting against the throttle lever was sitting against it. Uh, whenever there was some kind of an engine load that kicked on, like the air conditioner or something, any and anytime there's an engine load, you're going to see a, re a reduction in engine vacuum. And when an engine vacuum would reduce, it would uh, extend a little bit and keep the idle, you know, at an acceptable level. Calibrated to do that with its spring and the vacuum feed and all that. Escorts had it, some of the GM vehicles had it. Uh, the GM uh, computer command control stuff had a special tool uh, that you would use on this little notched nut right here to adjust it. I used to have a set of those tools. Like I've still got them somewhere. I don't know. We're, we'll probably dig in my toolbox and find them. Uh, but uh, this right here uh, was Ford's idle uh, speed control motor. And that thing was pretty cool the way that it worked. Uh, it, uh, had an idle tracking switch so that whenever you uh, release the throttle, uh, the throttle would come to the end of this. This little part right here would go, it would extend. Like some, some of you guys have probably seen that. This thing back in the day whenever I was working on those and they were prevalent all over the place, they cost about $140 from the dealer. And the problem that they typically gave was that the idle tracking switch would develop uh, resistance. And so it was just a closed switch. It had a signal return and voltage going to it. And the, in other words, it had, it's got four wires. And the four wires that are going to it, two of them operate the, the, the motor. And two of them are for the idle tracking switch. Well, on that one there, whenever you would put your foot on the throttle, the idle tracking switch would close and it would short that voltage away. Whenever you had your, let off the throttle, it would open and the voltage would come back. Uh, and whenever I would see one that was giving trouble, I would take and unplug that idle tracking switch and I would measure the uh, voltage, I mean, I'm sorry, the resistance, the ohms, and it should have been a dead short, you know, less than 5 ohms. I'd, I'd say, I think it should be, actually, I like for it, a brand new one would have just a dead short. And the whenever you, uh, it closed, when you put your foot on the uh, throttle, it would basically uh, be wide open. But what I would see when it was supposed to be closed, I'd see 50 ohms or something like that floating around. And when I saw something like that, uh, occasionally I would do this wacky stuff where I would uh, drill those little uh, brads out of it and pull the end off and I'd clean the idle tracking switch really, really good, put it all back together with pop rivets and I could fix one like that, you know. You know, of course, I've, I'm one of those kind of people who likes to fix something if I can, but basically if you want to prevent yourself from having a comeback, the smartest thing is just to pop one on there, you know. Um, but, and I also built a little tool using a rocker switch. Uh, out of a Jeep uh, Cherokee uh, that I could connect to this. I had the right connectors, you know, adapters and all. 
and for these things they have different connectors than that one on some of them they had round connectors and all anyway I could connect that thing and I would use that little power window switch and hook it up to power plug it into this had a little indicator light on it that I put in there a little LED and I could run it back and forth the only problem was you're going to find uh, problems with that idle tracking switch with a meter, meter a lot more than you are looking at an LED coming off the you know, you know illuminating and not illuminating uh, but believe it or not that thing uh, can have on the vehicle that I, w I was working one time on a Taurus that had a four cylinder in it and uh, that darn thing would stumble sometimes and it turned out that the problem with that stumble was the idle tracking switch and this idle speed control motor. It was the only time I ever saw that, but I just boggled my mind, you know, when I finally figured it out after I worked on it a while. Um, the uh, General Motors had a very similar idle speed control, but you might notice I put up here that the, uh, the normally uh, closed switch on this Ford is the opposite of the normally open switch on the GM. I used to get that mixed up in my mind. I knew they were opposites of one another, uh, but the GM one, uh, this one here, was originally designed and built by Carter. As far as I know, of course, there are a lot of people build them now. If you're still driving an old car, uh, this one right here was, uh, I guess, built by Delco or Delphi or somebody. I don't know who built it, but the long and the short of it was, it always seemed to me like a kind of a chump built thing that was kind of crummy and cheap. Also, this one was also used on some Renaults, uh, Renaults, uh, some of these old Renault Encores and Alliances. They had exactly the same part on them and all that, and it had an idle tracking switch and it had a little motor that. Uh, it acted as an idle compensator, but it was electronically handled and all that. Of course, you know, this stuff right here is all handled today and ever since about 2000 on some vehicles by electronic throttle bodies. Uh, and this stuff here is fun to talk about, but unless you work on a lot of old cars like some of the shops around here do, you probably wouldn't even worry with all this kind of stuff. Uh, the interesting thing to me was how the Asian people uh, that built these the cars over in uh, Toyotas and, and, and some of those other cars over there in um, Mazdas, they like to put hot water going through their idle speed control and that hot water was really important toward making it think work, work right. Um, but it was also really expensive. You know, the ones on the Fords and the, and the Dodges and all, I mean, heck, some of those you can buy from, you know, from 20 to $60 now or something. Uh, and these right here, were expensive to build apparently and they would fail and they were all different shapes so they didn't all look looked exactly like this one uh, but those darn things would would cost uh, you know four or five hundred dollars sometimes uh, it's real expensive it just make you sick to think about having to buy one of those darn things but um, the uh, notice I want you to notice this the uh, the GM the Dodge and the uh, Jeep and you know some of the other ones uh, have these kind on there and the Ford they had four wires they were stepper motors they had one uh, but they were slightly different in the way they'd operate just because you've got a, one like that they don't operate all the same way uh, we had a little box that they sent us from Jeep it had a little rocker switch on it and some electronics in it and to test the idle speed control on the Jeeps we would unplug the uh, wire harness plug this tool in because it was made to plug right in there and we could use that little rocker switch to run that thing in and out. The little stepper motor has got a little thread, threaded uh, shaft and it's got a little nut around it that's driven uh, you know, with these step, with the stepper motor. You know, the little windings would, uh, would basically, it was almost like a, a you know, a three phase thing, <laughs> the way it worked. But it would have one power and it would have uh, three grounds or something like that. I mean, there's various different ways it's configured. They weren't all wired exactly the same way. But these all work the same way because when the idle air control, what it does is it opens a path for the air to flow around the throttle plate. You know if you have a vacuum leak sometimes on a fuel-injected vehicle, it'll make it run lean and all, but it also causes the idle speed to raise up sometimes. If it's big enough, the engine won't even start running. But uh, on the Ford, uh, they would apply some current, and it would pull a little pintle against the, uh, you know, a spring and open a passage you know all right so on this Lincoln town car came in and it wouldn't idle and you know of course we watched the throttle body out a lot like watch and uh, turned out that the idle air control what I always like to do was I would take the idle air control on those vehicles and with the idle air control unplugged I'd clean make sure the throttle body was clean 
and you know if it had an allo stop screw, it was okay to adjust it according to the you know shop maker procedures. I would basically set it so it was idling at about 550 with the idle air control disconnected. That kept it out of that dead band where the engine controller would say, well, it's idling where it needs to be anyway, and I won't use the idle air control, and it'll learn that nonsense. But uh, this guy tickled me, the guy that I was talking about in a previous video, um, you know, had, had come over there, and he said, I can't get this Ranger to idle. I think I may have told that story. And I told him to pull this off, unplug that, do this, do that, and, you know, wash that out and set it to where it idles about 550, and you'll be okay. And, um, Anyway, he went and did all the stuff I told him to do, and he came back and he said, you must have seen this before. And I said, no, I never have. <laughs> he got me by the throat. Ah. But anyway, the long and the short of it was there was a uh, good circuit all the way, uh, the good circuit loop from the heat power relay going to this idle air control going all the way to the engine controller. I could unplug the engine controller with the key on and the heat power relay closed. Uh, you know, I could actually find a good straight, you know, with the engine controller unplugged, at the pin on the engine controller, I found that, that there was a circuit, you know, good circuit, um, all the way through that darn thing. And um, I said, okay, um, uh, that's interesting. Uh, so I said, uh, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't idle at all. So I said, it looks to me like we're going to have to have a, uh, how did this go out there? should have 10 ohms of resistance right here. You know, I'll, here's another thing. Some of these things were built with a clamping diode inside there, and some of them didn't have a clamping diode. Uh, they just had the, you know, but one way or another. This one here, we installed the new one. It was a standard ignition brand, but it still had no idle uh, because it turned out that that thing was dead shorted inside, and it had fried the driver in the engine controller. Of course, there was no real good way to know that, uh, you know, without replacing the idle air control. So I said, well, it looks like we're going to have to have an engine controller too. So we took an engine controller and put on there. Uh, and we had to get another idle speed control because this is what blew me away. The first one we pulled off of that car, and, and, I, and I never saw this in my career at Ford Place. The first one we pulled off that car was dead short. I mean, it was just shorted dead. It didn't have 10 ohm, it was short. And so I replaced that. And then I said, well, well, then when we found out the engine controller was fried by it, uh, we put an engine controller on, and that engine, it still wouldn't idle, and then I found out the brand new one that I got from Standard Ignition had a dead short. And that was aggravating as all get out. And the reason was because, you know, I actually, you know, compared it to another one uh, that, that I had laying there. Uh, and, I did, so, you know, sometimes you just wonder, have, have I lost it or what? You know, why is the one that I pulled off dead shorted, and why is the new one that came out of the box got a dead short? Uh, I sent a letter to Standard Ignition uh, on behalf of the parts dealer because, you know, they just, they were, weren't buying any of this apparently. And uh, so I told them exactly how I tested it and exactly how I reached the conclusions I did and all that. And th he had given me another uh, brand new idle air control, and he also gave me a new... Uh, uh, engine uh, replacement engine controller, but they never paid him a penny for that. They just rejected it, the whole thing out of hand, you know. But um, anyway, the uh, this uh, new IAC had destroyed that PCM. Now this is my ignition systems trainer board. I've actually got a video on my YouTube channel uh, showing this, and basically what I did was I started with points. And I worked my, there's a distributor up here, an old Chevy distributor, and I would wire that thing up and turn it through, and you could watch this spark pop right here. And then I would move over to the Ford. Well, I'd take the electronic ignition, using the same coil, I'd use the same coil for the points, for the Chrysler, for the Ford. And then I would take that and wire this up to the ballast resistor, to the coil. And then you could hook this one right here, on this Chrysler one, you could hook, uh, ground, power, and these two right here uh, would basically be the ones that would that would go, would be the pickup call. So if you hooked uh, the, uh, I say ground, that one right there, you, this has to be grounded, because uh, it's got its power register right there. One way or another, you could wire this up, and you could touch these together, and it would go pop, 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 and pop the call. Uh, and then we'd wire this one up down here, that. I'd show them how to wire that up. You know, there's a 
fuse down here in case it you know blows. Anyway, I'd show them how that one worked, and then this one right here, uh, I would have them touch the positive battery terminal and just you know tap these wires over here, and it would go pop, 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 pop right there. And then I had a distributor here with TF5 that would fire the spark plugs, and then this one here was hooked to an engine controller I had along on the side, and that would basically fire all of these right here. And so that was just the one somebody just wanted to point out. I mean, you can see there's a there's an ignition trainer board video where I'm using this board on my YouTube channel somewhere there. Well, this Toyota MR2 came in there with a hunting idle problem, and it just wasn't working like it ought to at all. And initially, uh, you know, whenever I partially covered up the hole that where you know that he gets his air to go around the throttle plate, pull it off, you can see it there. I had to actually um, uh, bypass the fuel pump connections on the mass airflow sensor uh, or on the vein airflow sensor so that the fuel pump would run so that I could start it and then run it with the with the airflow sensor out of the loop where I could have the throttle body open while I was doing it and it would uh, and when I covered that up you know it would, it would idle too high and stay up there too long and when it finally did start to warm up it would hunt and just all this kind of stuff but it took it a long long time to ever come down off fast idle and so I Initially, I put a new one of these on there. I think it cost $75. I don't remember what it was. Uh, but you see the, the water, where the water goes through here? Now, what we wound up finding out was, and I, I may have mentioned this on a previous video, I got a clear plastic tube. I unhooked the hoses that went to that darn thing, and I hooked it up, uh, this clear tube, from one hose to the other. I like to do that on heater hoses, too, you know. And I started it up, and there was an air bubble that was right there all the time and so what it amounted to there was supposed to be a restriction restriction in the pipes it was vaguely similar to the uh, the, the DPFE uh, sensor in the, the EGR feed pipe on Fords but it was coolant and so you had a restriction so that it would force the coolant to go through that thing and you know you I heard a, there was a car that a friend of mine was talking about the other day that was doing almost exactly the same thing and I asked him I said if you have water going through there you need to put a clear tube and make sure there's water going through there because it ought to be just screaming through there all the time and so I took a, a little hose off that was between the feeds you know for these where these were coming off of the heater hose pipe and I put a nut in there like a 10 millimeter nut and that created just enough restriction or it was forcing that coolant through there and I completely cleared that problem up. Now I will say we worked on that for a while before we figured it out. But if that's not flowing through there, you know, you got to do that. That old MR2 is a booger bear. Dash pot function still exists though, and that's something I should have said earlier probably. Even on the ones with electronic throttle bodies and all this, they are going to come down slowly when they know you've let off the gas. Now you know whenever you switch on one of these vehicles, it's going to look, if you're not touching the gas, it's going to look at where the gas is, I mean where the closed throttle is, <coughs> and that's what it's going to use as closed throttle. If it sees anything above closed throttle, I don't know exactly what that criteria is, but on this one here, you might notice that sometimes it would, it would be idling too high when the guy would stop. And, uh, and his, his whole deal was, and this was the two readings that we got, it was at closed throttle, the idle air control was at 33, and it was at 0.87 volts, right? 870 millivolts. At part throttle, see, that wasn't that much more, but it considered that part throttle, the idle RPM was just high enough where the guy was annoyed by it, and you notice your idle air control was a little higher because it was still in dash pot mode. It thought it needed to hold that until you let completely off the throttle so it could come down slowly, and that was an issue that we ran into on a Ranger. And what we had was these right here, those crimps look just fine. The wires look just fine. But what I wound up doing on several of these, and I had to do that on some mass airflow sensors too that were throwing mysterious codes, uh, but not on this one. Anyway, we would make sure those things are standing up so that when you solder them, solder doesn't run down in here. Have them things sticking up, get your solder in there, and just solder all these connections. And that's what it took to take care of that one. That's all it needed was those connections to be soldered really easy to do. Anybody that knows how to solder uh, ought to be able to do that. Here's another one. Uh, can you look at the forklift? The battery's not charging. And whenever I turned the wheel and looked under there, this bolt was just about to come out of there. <laughs> and the alternator belt was loose and it was slipping all the time. It wouldn't charge your battery. Um, 
This one here was a dirty mass airflow sensor. Don't you know that was a hard picture I took? I mean, I got on that thing and I lit it just right and I got my camera on it. But I've seen that repeatedly. I have sluggish acceleration and low power. Uh, one time I had this uh, explorer, this guy came into the write-up area on, service rider called me out here to talk to him because he really didn't know what pocket to put it in. And the guy says, sometimes my vehicle will ping to beat the band. Sometimes it doesn't ping at all. It runs just perfectly normal without warning. Well, I'll, you know, I'll switch it off. I'll start it up. It'll just ping and labor knock and have loss of power and all that. Next time I'll start it up, it'll run just fine. And I just got to thinking about that. And I went out there, I went with him right there the, under the hood. And we took the uh, air cleaner loose. You know, you're looking at the top of the breather, which is the clean side of the breather. And whenever I raised it up, on the clean side of the breather, between the, which would be between the breather and the mass airflow, the screen, you know, some of them have a little wire screen over the mass airflow, uh, there was a roach's wing, just a half of a, of a cockroach's wing laying on top of that air filter. And I says, I imagine that wing is probably jumping up there and getting on that screen right in front of these uh, elements here, these platinum wire elements, and it's keeping the airflow from going through there. It's causing it to run really lean. And uh, I said, so why don't we do this? I said, let's just get rid of this little roach's wing out of here because nothing should be between there. Uh, and let's see what that does. Well, you know, he, he never had a problem again. Uh, he was happy as a lark. Um, and you don't need to charge somebody, you know, $100 for every time you open their hood, you know. Uh, I was always sort of a diplomatic sort like that if I didn't have a lot of time invested in one that was just a you know on a lark let's just see if it'll work anyway long and short of it is uh, these right here are worse to get this way if somebody is using second rate air filters or if they have air filters that have holes in them and it's letting dirt go through here and it's getting cooked on that hot wire they make some stuff you know a lot of people know about cleaning these things off I worked on a Crown Victoria one time though that had came in for a different problem and it was under warranty and I didn't like the way that it accelerated. It just felt like it, you know, those Crown Vicks, when they're in it, and it, my dad drives a, a Grand Marquis with that 4.6 in it. That thing will run right out from under you. I mean, it's really got some power. Uh, but that one didn't feel right, and I looked with a light down in there, and it looked to me like that little hot wire plastic had melted that platinum wire into that plastic, and it wasn't able to do it. What the deal is, it uses one of these to measure the temperature of the incoming air, and it heats the other one up to like something like 300 degrees Celsius hotter than the cold one. And the amount of current it has to use to keep it that hot, it tells the engine controller, it interpolates that information to determine how much air is flowing through there. And that's kind of how that works. Uh, this uh, guy at the tire store the other day uh, said that somebody came in and said they had rotated their tires and now the car would pull. Well, they waited too long to rotate the tires and they had more wear on one than the other, and because they rotated them the way that they did, they wound up with a, a front tire and a back tire. I think they moved one fire to the right and back one to the front or something like that, and uh, they wound up with the tire pull. He checked the alignment, nothing wrong with it, and he just put the tires back like they were because the wear gets to the point to where rotating the tires will cause you problems. Some of these little uh, Honda cars and stuff, little Asian cars, if you drive them too long without rotating the tires, and then you rotate the tires, you may have this wear pattern on the back, and when you put it on the front, it makes the thing sound like a tractor tire going down the road. You know, I've had to basically put the tires back where they were when somebody would come in and say, I had my tires rotated over at the tire store, and now it sounds really noisy, and you could, you know, feel of it. And the, the wear that had been from a slight misalignment of the rear tires, you'd have some ripply kind of wear on the back ones, and when you put them on the front, you know, they just get really loud all of a sudden. Um, when regular brakes won't read out, this is my, my buddy Mike, has, he built this thing. Uh, this is stopped up up here with a, one of those rubber radiator, I mean rubber expansion plugs with a clamp on it. And he basically put a regulator on here and, you know, made him, got him a little valve stem put in there. And he would uh, clamp that onto the uh, master cylinder. He made it for a particular car that they fought and fought and fought and fought trying to get the brakes to bleed on it. And he actually put you know, you dial in just a little bit of pressure right there through your regulator uh, on that, and that enabled them to bleed the brakes on one that they had been fighting with trying to bleed it the dimensional way. It's like a homemade brake bleeder, and it's wouldn't, you know, it doesn't cost much to build one like that. You put the stuff together and all. Uh, the Mercury Sable story, uh, one day I had uh, told this, I had this old 97 Mercury Sable, 
And um, we had actually put an engine in that car yet a year before that, and then they decided they wanted to, it started to get some transmission problems a few months later, and they decided they'd just give it to the automotive department. And we were out there, and it ran real good. And I, I told one of my students, it was a newer one, uh, we had the, you know, the, the wireless vehicle interface hooked up so you could see it on the screen on the computer. And I said, I want you to bring this thing up to 1500 and hold it there, and we're going to watch the oxygen sensor start to switch. And so he went ahead uh, to him, bring it up to 1500 means go to the floor and come back to 1500, I guess, because whenever he went to the floor, the uh, gas pedal stuck under the floor mat and uh, it screamed into, I mean, it, it, it shot up so fast. Uh, into the stratosphere that it didn't have time to uh, protect itself, you know, with uh, the uh, rev limiter. <laughs> and it threw two rods out. This is what it looked like in the pan after we pulled the pan off. Things sound like a bomb going off. Well, one of my guys, a guy named Frank, was a Desert Storm veteran, and he's had a little, still had a little shell shock. Um, long and short of it is, it's that big boom, because he was standing around the car, scared him so bad he almost jumped over a workbench. He's about 50 years old. And um, anyway, uh, that was one of those wonderful days. It was a trainer vehicle, so it didn't really matter that much. And I had some other engines. And what we did was we pulled the motor out of it. We just cobbled together some parts and built an engine from scrap <laughs> and put it all back together. Uh, but that was just uh, one of those days, you know, that uh, never forgot about. The last thing I want to tell you about this right here, I mentioned this on the last video I did about these laminated uh, fuse panels and now when you pry this back you see all that green cruddy stuff in there uh, although some of the F-150s and exp expeditions and stuff the windshield would leak on this and it would cause it to be uh, kind of uh, chalky and messed up and it would short out between the laminates and it causes all kinds of electrical problems and so we had to change some of those I just want to do a little follow-up on that because I found that picture you know, I got so many pictures, I have to dig, 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 trying to find the one I'm looking for, and then I'll stumble across the one I was looking for last week. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. I hope that you enjoyed the video, and, uh, you know, leave me, uh, you know, comments or thumbs up or, you know, whatever you feel like you uh, got out of this, and, and I really appreciate you guys watching, and I'll talk to you next time.